Okay, so tonight is all Augustine all night. Both hours are about uh, St. Augustine. And uh, you can pronounce his name Augustine or Augustine. It doesn't matter to me. Um, it seems that uh, it's, it's fashionable in the uh, patristics world to say Augustine, but uh, if you say St. Augustine, that's okay with me. His name is... Aurelius Augustinus, and he was born in 354 and died in 430. And so that's where we are. We're uh, in the second half of the 4th century and beginning of the 5th century. He's from North Africa, which is uh, uh, what is now Algeria, born of a mixed marriage a Christian mother and a pagan father. His mother's name is Monica, and keep her in mind because she's known to the church as Saint Monica. His father's name is Patricius. Uh, Patricius was a pagan but eventually converted. Monica and Patricius gave uh, little Augie the best education one could get in the fourth century. And he went to college, um, or what amounted to college back then, in the great city of Carthage in North Africa. Um, again, this is the, uh, the main city in North Africa. It's the second most important city, uh, historically anyway, in the West. <coughs> Choking on, caught on uh, chalk dust here, but uh, he went to Carthage for... Um, for his secondary education, and Carthage, remember, is in what is, what is now in Tunisia. Now, uh, Augustine had a difficult time accepting his mother's faith, Christianity, because he read the Latin Bible and thought that it was crude. Now remember, the concept of a Latin Bible is still pretty new at this point, and so the Latin, uh, the translation from Greek into Latin, uh, Augustine, was kind of snooty about that and felt that uh, it, it wasn't a very polished Latin translation. And like many sort of philosophically minded people in the ancient world, he associated form with content, style with, uh, or, or the value of the style with the value of the meaning. And so he felt like Christianity was, uh, wasn't really worth his time. Towards this, uh, this part of his life, Augustine began a long-term relationship with a woman who remains unnamed throughout his autobiography, but she has a lasting effect on him and on his life. They had a son. The son's name is Adeodatus. Adeodatus, um, which means a gift from God, though it's not clear which God we're talking about at this point in his life. Um, Augustine eventually joined a group called the Manichees. And I need to tell you a little bit about the Manichees. The Manichees are the third and fourth century evolution of Gnosticism. They're dualistic, they're syncretistic. Uh, the, the, the cult was started by a guy named Mani, who was from Persia. His dates are 216, to 277. Now this is important because um, Augustine will make every attempt to accept this as his religion. And Manichaeism is a, a further syncretism of Gnosticism. So Manny himself had Gnostic parents, um, but their Gnosticism wasn't enough for him, so he added even more to it, um, eventually going to India and studying Buddhism. Uh, and adding also uh, Persian or Zoroastrian astrology, think the Magi, right? Um, and elements of Christianity, Judaism, and other things. He, uh, when he returned to Persia, according to the story, he converted the Persian king and court. Um, but eventually, when the king died, depending on the version of the story, he was either driven out of Persia by the Magi, and then traveled around claiming to be the voice of the Holy Spirit, or other accounts say that after the king died, he was executed. Um, so it's not clear exactly what happens to him. But the movement he started became 
kind of the Masonic Lodge of the ancient world. It was an underground cult favored by aristocrats who treated it kind of like a fraternity. Now remember, you know, we're moving into the time period now of Theodosius when he would make Christianity the only legal religion and he would outlaw other religions. And so Manichaeism will be one of those outlawed religions. Um, but the difference between the Manichees and earlier Gnosticism is that earlier Gnosticism was not connectional in any way. It was a, it was a disconnected group of sects under, you know, each having its own teacher and um, with no real, you know, uh, unity. But Manichaeism was connectional. It was almost like you think of a denomination in the sense that um, they had an organization, a hierarchy, a structure. They had organized meetings with liturgies and hymns. They had scriptures, which were the writings of Manny and his disciples. And, uh, and they had their, their secret meetings, which led many to, to, um, to, to believe that they were practicing uh, magic or you know, other sort of um, taboo rituals, which is actually kind of similar to the way the Romans saw the Christians in the early days. You know? um, anytime you have a meeting behind closed doors, they start to assume you must be doing something terrible. The thing that was attractive to Augustine about the Manichees is that they claimed to be able to answer all your questions. They claimed to be able to explain the universe. Um, and they claimed that their members had all of these answers. But, you know, like Gnosticism, or like any of the modern versions of Gnosticism, this is not a, a religion where they'll tell you what you believe first and then give you a chance to decide whether you want to join or not. This was a cult where you first have to decide to join and then they'll tell you what to believe. But then even once you join, there is a kind of a caste system within the cult. And so there are levels of membership, primarily two levels of membership. Um, there is uh, a, the, the level called the, the elect. And they were a celibate elite. They were ascetics, they were vegetarians, and they were the ones who had the answers. Um, the lower level of membership was simply called a hearer, um, kind of analogous to someone in the catechumenate in the church, uh, but a person could remain a hearer forever in, uh, within the Manichees. So as it turns out, most of the members in the Manichaean uh, sect were hearers, and it was sort of like you know they were the lay people and the elect were the were the clergy with the hearers supporting the elect. So Augustine became a hearer. He was never one of the elect, and so he was eventually disillusioned with the sect because they never really did answer all of his questions about the universe, and they kept putting him off and putting him off and kept at, expecting him to wait for other teachers and. Um, Eventually, he was just completely disillusioned and, and left the group, although never really, or he, at, at this point, didn't really sever his ties with the Manichees. Um, but he tried, he tried various forms of philosophy and eventually came to an important conclusion. He realized that what he had been doing was trying to find answers, trying to get knowledge. And then he thought if he could just have the knowledge, then he'd have something to believe in. As if first you get knowledge and then you get faith from that knowledge. And he realized it doesn't work that way. Because if you wait till you have all the answers, you'll never have anything to believe in. And so he realized it's actually the opposite. It's not that you get knowledge first and then believe in it. It's not that knowledge leads to belief. But it's the other way around. First you believe in something because you choose to, and then you learn about it and your knowledge increases. So belief leads to knowledge. Well, uh, Augustine moved to Rome where he became a teacher of rhetoric. And um, he found out very quickly why now we make students pay the tuition ahead of time because back then, apparently they hadn't figured that out yet, and you could conduct a whole class and expect the students to pay on the last day of class, 
And then guess what happened on the last day of class? They didn't show up. Mm -hmm. So uh, Augustine became disillusioned with that as well. And he left Rome, and he still had enough connections with the Manichees. Um, they helped him get the position of professor of rhetoric in Milan. Now you know Milan is the new up and coming big city, right? Because uh, it's more centrally located in Europe. So Milan is an important city. And, uh, and Augustine arrived in Milan in the year 385. And when he got there, the Bishop of Milan was an important uh, bishop known as Ambrose. I'm going to put him over here. Ambrose. Ambrose of Milan. In fact, according to the story, um, when, uh, when, when Augustine traveled, when he left North Africa and went to Rome, his mother went with him, followed him, praying for him all the way for his conversion, praying for his soul. When he left Rome and went to Milan, again, she followed him to Milan. And the story is that uh, when she got to Milan, she uh, had an audience with Bishop Ambrose, and she, she complained to the bishop, you know, Bishop, when we're in North Africa, they do the Eucharist one way, and then in Rome, they do it another way, and now here in Milan, you do it yet another way, and I don't know which way is right. And according to the tradition, Ambrose's answer was, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> uh, now, you know, whether or not that story is apocryphal, I don't know, but the point is, is that, you know, what he's saying is that it's not necessarily the case that Liturgy has to be exactly the same from place to place, that there is room for some diversity there. I want to tell you about Ambrose because he's an important figure. Ambrose was Bishop of Milan from 374 to 397. 374 to 397, that's when he was Bishop. That's not his whole life. Um, now, you may remember when we were talking about the Arian controversy, I said that... Uh, that Arianism doesn't go away after the Eastern Councils. In fact, it moves to the West because the barbarian tribes were missionized by Arian bishops, and so Arianism moves West. And in fact, Arianism had, had uh, caught on in some areas of the Western world, and uh, in fact, Ambrose's predecessor as Bishop of Milan was an Arian. And when he died, there was a great disturbance in the city of Milan over who might be the next bishop. Because most of the people wanted a, a pro-Nicene, an Orthodox bishop, not an Arian bishop. And in fact, um, a, a mob sort of uh, was threatening to riot over the choice of who would be the next bishop of Milan. So according to the story, um, the governor rode in on horseback. Now the governor was Ambrose. He was not clergy, he was a politician, but he was an excellent speaker. And so uh, when Ambrose rode in to disperse the crowd and try to prevent the riot, here was a man who was known to be an excellent speaker. Now if you think about it, you, you want a good preacher, right? He was known to be an excellent speaker, and he was known to support uh, the Council of Nicaea and to be against Arianism. And so he was chosen, even though he wasn't even ordained a priest, he was chosen to be the next bishop. And according to the story, when he rode in and the crowd was quieted, a child's voice was heard saying, Ambrose, bishop. Now again, the story may be apocryphal, but, but watch for that theme of the voice of a child, right? From the mouth of babes, right? So Ambrose had become the bishop by out of sort of public acclamation. Um, and he was very popular. And so when Augustine arrives in Milan, 385, of course, he's the new professor of rhetoric. He's got to go hear the bishop who has the reputation of being the best speaker around. And so he went to hear Ambrose to hear his speaking style. But he came back 
for the content of the sermons that he was hearing. And one of the things that he liked so much about Ambrose was that Ambrose interpreted the scriptures allegorically or non-literally. And I'm speaking specifically or especially about the Old Testament here. Um, but Augustine really felt freed by the allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament. And it allowed him to consider Christianity and take it seriously. Now about this same time, Augustine broke off his relationship with the woman who uh, is, for all intents and purposes, his common-law wife at this point. Um, but he broke off his relationship with her because he was really not able to marry her. They were not of the same social class. And so he felt he needed to take a wife of his own social standing in order to you know, support him in his role as the professor of rhetoric in Milan. So he became engaged to a young girl. And when I say young, I mean like 12. Now, girls could be engaged at the age of 12, but even the Romans knew you didn't consummate a marriage with a 12-year-old girl. So um, the idea is that she was his fiance, but they would wait until she was 16 or whatever to be married. Um, what Augustine found out, though, was that he couldn't wait, and so he ended up taking another mistress, and uh, he never married the girl. But uh, this really led to um, a great disappointment in himself and in his own ability to exercise self-control with his sexuality. So we will come back to that because this is going to contribute to his very uh, pessimistic outlook on human nature and of course on human sexuality as well. In the year 386, uh, Augustine was converted to Christianity. And this is recorded in his autobiography as well. Uh, and according to his own account, he was in a garden. On the bench is a copy of the scriptures. And there was no one around, but he heard the voice of a child. And he heard the voice say, take it and read. And he picked up the scriptures and read where it opened and uh, read a passage from Paul's letter to the Romans and was convicted by it and made a commitment to be a Christian and to get baptized. After uh, he and his son, Adeodatus, were baptized, he decided to go back to North Africa. So he and his entourage, including his mother, left um, Milan, went to Rome, and while they were waiting for the ship that would take them to North Africa from Rome, uh, they were in the uh, port city of Ostia, uh, and that's where Monica passed away. And if you read it in his autobiography, well, you, you will read it because I've assigned it, um, it's a very touching account of her at the end of her life and uh, basically saying, you know, I can die happy because my prayers have been answered. My son has become a Christian. And in fact, Monica today is known as the patron saint of mothers who pray for their wayward sons. Uh, so Augustine and uh, his friends did go back to North Africa and in, intended to form a monastic community. They went to the city of Hippo, Hippo Regis. Uh, this is why Augustine is, uh, is known as Augustine of Hippo. Actually, there's only one G there. Ignore that second G. <laughs> Augustine of Hippo. And as I said, usually when it's somebody of some place, that means they're the bishop of that place, right? So what's going to happen? He's going to become the bishop. When he first gets to Hippo, uh, there is a bishop in place there. Um, and though he seems to want to simply be a monk and live a life of solitude and prayer and studying the scriptures, he was eventually ordained a priest. And according to the story, he cried when he was ordained a priest. And some people say it was because he really just wanted to uh, be a monk. He didn't want to be a priest. Others said he cried because he really wanted to be the bishop and he wasn't getting to be the bishop yet. But eventually, 
eventually you see where this is going. He did become the bishop. Um, what I didn't mention, though, is that when Augustine, when, when the, the previous bishop dies and Augustine becomes the bishop of Hippo, he's not the only bishop in town. There is another bishop who is the leader of another Christian community in North Africa known as the Donatists. And I'm going to tell you about them in a few minutes, but we're going to have to put that aside uh, just for a moment. But uh, we'll get back to that. Right about the end of the 4th century, around 397 or so, Augustine wrote his autobiography called The Confessions. It was published right at the turn of the 5th century, 400-401, and it is really the first honest autobiography from the ancient world. In fact, all other autobiographies and biographies in the ancient world are really a form of hagiography, or uh, writings about a saint, or meant to glorify the main character. But Augustine's confessions are not meant to glorify him. They're meant to confess, as the title suggests, his, his failings, his shortcomings. Um, one in particular I'll tell you about, and you'll read it, but uh, it's what I refer to as the pear incident. And there's a, there's a story of him when he is a young man, and he's out with some friends, and they uh, come upon a pear orchard. Not his, the pears, obviously someone else's, but they steal the pears. And... Um, and then he says, you know, we weren't hungry. We didn't need the pears. We didn't eat them. We, they threw them at some pigs or whatever and, and wasted the pears. And Augustine realized a couple of things in thinking back on this. You know, he says, if I was alone, I would not have done this thing. So he realized the power of what we call peer pressure, right? The power of the mob mentality, the social pressure to go along with the group. And he realized how strong that is and how it overcomes the, the individual willpower. The other thing he realized is that human beings are really the only animals capable of pointless destruction, right? I mean, here they are, they stole these pears, they wasted the pears. What other animal does that, right? So human beings have this capability that's, that's uh, you know, on a level of, of, of de destructiveness that seems to be unique among, uh, you know, all of God's creatures. And so, you know, when you combine these things, it makes Augustine really very skeptical about any notions of human progress toward perfection or uh, even the ability for the human will to choose to do the right thing. And eventually he, be, he came to believe that perfection in the human being is simply not possible. Habit, social pressure, these things are just too strong. What that means is, is that the less he trusts himself, and believe me, he, he's still got enough of, of a, of, of a self-esteem, self-confidence to believe that, you know what, if I can't do it, nobody can, right? I mean, he, he gets how smart he is. He knows that. And he believes that he's sort of the test case for humanity, I think. So, you know, if I can't do it, nobody can, right? And so he, he thinks, okay, if we humans can't trust ourselves, that leaves only one who can be trusted, and that's God. And so the less he trusts himself, the more he puts all the emphasis on God and on God's grace and on God's, um, what we might call, sovereignty or providence or election. And so I'll come back to that, but keep that in mind, that this uh, is in part based on his own personal experience with his own disappointments in himself and his ability to have willpower. Um, what he realizes is that conversion does not mean necessarily automatic sanctification. Right? Conversion is not the arrival of some place, of some place of perfection. Conversion is simply the beginning of a journey. Conversion doesn't mean you won't sin anymore, but it just means you've set yourself on a path. And um, 
or more, more precisely, God has set you on a path. And he says in the Confessions, speaking to God, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, my heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. It's that always on the journey, always in process. All right, so let me tell you about a couple of uh, Augustine's most important writings. And you're going to read some things, and I'm going to tell you about some other things here. Um, one of his most important theological writings is called On the Trinity, which you may remember we have a document from Novation called On the Trinity. It's kind of a popular title. Uh, but uh, in fact, what Augustine does is he takes Novation to the next level. I told you Novation takes Tertullian to the next level. Augustine takes Novation to the next level and really, um, uh, really brings... The, uh, the theology and Christology to kind of a pinnacle. So uh, the thing you need to remember is that Augustine is a disciple of Ambrose. Ambrose was anti-Arian. So Augustine is anti-Arian. And in the document on the Trinity, he talks about God as Trinity in a way uh, so as to refute Arianism. He, uh, and, and one of the things he does, and I already told you about this, one of the things he does is he uh, talks about the double procession of the Spirit. In other words, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, in Latin, filioque. And so this is uh, you know, his contribution at this point, and this is going to make its way into Western theology and, of course, into the Western creed. Eventually, when the Easterners get wind of this, it's going to sound like modalism, Sabellianism to them. But, uh, but in fact, it's Augustine's safeguard against Arianism. Augustine also goes farther than any of the previous theologians uh, in, in saying that, in talking about God and, and divine simplicity. Remember, we talked about divine simplicity as you know, God doesn't have parts. God doesn't have things that you can separate from God or God's self. Uh, and so Augustine actually says, even in terms of the attributes of God, like omnipresence, omniscience, these are not attributes that God has because God doesn't have anything. God simply is. Because if God is truly simplex, you cannot separate what God is from what God has. So for Augustine, God doesn't have anything. God simply is what God is. And he comes up with some interesting analogies for the Trinity, where uh, he, he admits that they're not perfect, uh, and that these analogies are, you know, ha have their drawbacks. But uh, one of the analogies that he uses is uh, a personal analogy of the, the Trinity as related to what, what the person has in terms of memory, intellect, and will. So sort of three aspects of a personality uh, are analogous to the three persons of the Trinity. What is it again, sir? Uh, memory, intellect, and will. And, you know, again, he admits that it's not a perfect analogy. And there's another one he uses. Another analogy for the Trinity is uh, the analogy of the lover, the beloved, and the love. So what he says is imagine the father as the lover and the son as the beloved. You know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? And the Holy Spirit as the love which binds them. Now, the problem with this analogy, though, is that it reduces the Holy Spirit to, seems to reduce the Holy Spirit to something less than full personhood. Uh, because if we describe the Holy Spirit as the love that binds the Father and Son, um, then the Holy Spirit seems to become something uh, more like the, the substance of, divi of divinity rather than a uh, distinct divine person. And so, you know, these analogies aren't, aren't great, but... Uh, you can see how Augustine experimented with analogies. At the end of On the Trinity, he says that to study 
is to understand what we believe. To study is to understand what we believe. In other words, you have to believe first, and then you can study it. Then you can learn to understand it. This is the lesson he learned after his disappointment with the Manichees. You, you don't understand something first and say, great, now that I understand this, I'm going to believe in it. Now, first you believe in something, and then you learn to understand it. But, of course, you'll never understand it completely. In the year 410, something happened that no one in the Western world thought could happen. Anyone remember what happened in the year 410? The city of Rome was sacked by the Goths. So they came in with their black clothes and their blue fingernails and their tattoos and their body piercings. <laughs> no, not those Goths. <laughs> the actual 5th century barbarian Goths. The, uh, the city of Rome fell to invading barbarians. Now, this was, if you'll allow the analogy, their 9-11. This was the thing they thought could never happen. This was the thing they thought God, or the gods, would never allow the city of Rome to fall. And um, even though this is now after Theodosius and his edict and, and you know, the making Christianity the only legal religion and the outlawing of other religions, even though this is after that, there's still enough pagans around in the empire to say, uh-huh, see, see what you did? In other words, they blamed it on the church. And uh, so Christianity was blamed for the fall of Rome, as if to say that because we abandoned the old gods, they removed their protection and the city fell. And Augustine wrote two documents that are basically his response to that accusation. The big one is, of course, the City of God. The City of God was written uh, over a span of time between 413 and 427. And the other is the uh, Handbook on Faith, Hope, and Love, which is also called the Enchiridion on Faith, Hope, and Love. And basically, Augustine's response to this accusation that you know, Christianity caused the fall of Rome goes like this. Rome is not really the eternal city. In fact, there are two cities. You can belong to the human city, you can be a citizen of the human city, or you can be a citizen of the true eternal city, city of God, kingdom of God, um, but you can't be citizen, you can't have dual citizenship. It's one or the other. And your citizenship depends on the object of your love. Toward what is your love oriented? If your love is oriented toward the things of the world, then you are a citizen of the human city. If your love is oriented toward God, then you're a citizen of the city of God. Augustine says, the motivation for our life of faith should be love. Not fear of punishment or even hope of a reward in heaven, because both of those are selfish motivations. The motivation should be love. But love, your love, has to be oriented toward the right thing. Because if you love anything, that you can lose, you will always live with the fear of losing it. Or if you don't have it yet, you'll live with the fear of not getting it. So um, if you love anything of the world, then it's not a pure love, it's not a perfect love because it's, it's a love that has fear. It's, it, you, you have this fear of losing what you love or not getting what you love. In fact, Augustine implies that all sin ultimately comes from fear because what happens is it is fear, the fear of that loss that causes people to commit sin. When we perceive other people as a threat to us 
having or getting what we love, then we try to get rid of that threat and we sin against other people because the thing we love becomes more important than the people. So, Augustine says the only way you can truly be happy or without that fear is by loving the one thing you cannot lose. And the only thing you cannot lose is that which is eternal, and that's God. But the reason you can't lose God is not has nothing to do with you. Because if it was up to us to hold on to God, we could not. We would lose God. We would even lose God. But we, we can't lose God because God holds on to us by grace. In fact, by his later uh, documents, Augustine came to believe that grace is irresistible. That if God wants you, God will get you. There's nothing you can do about it. And I, I like to think that when you read the confessions, his mother Monica is kind of a picture of God's grace. Because everywhere he goes, she follows him. Constantly praying for him. And so I think Monica rep represents grace in the confessions, following him uh, at every turn. But the point for Augustine here, the theological point, is that when you press this to, to talk about salvation, when it becomes a soteriology, those who are saved are saved by divine election, not by their own free will, right? Because if we could, if, if, if it was up to us to choose God and, and to persevere, to hold on to God, we couldn't do it. So the only way anyone perseveres is because God holds on to them. And so this becomes the, a, a doctrine of election or what we might call predestination. And Augustine believes it has to be this way because humanity is so fallen that it has lost free will. Now notice, notice what Augustine is doing here. Um, we're going to talk about this in the second hour. But... Uh, he is, he is shifting the Western world's understanding of the human person, of anthropology, away from a belief in free will. Uh, now, this is consistent with the doctrine of original sin, but Augustine did not invent the idea of original sin. Uh, but he does build on it. And he builds on it with his own experience, based on uh, you know, his, his own pessimism about human nature and the ability uh, or inability of human willpower, all of this pushes him to a doctrine of election because everything has to rely on the grace of God. It can't rely on, on the human will because anything that relies on the human will will always live with that fear of uncertainty. This is how he cycles back to the city of God, right? If you put your faith in the city, in the human city, like Rome, you will be disappointed. The only, the only place to put your faith that leads to any real security is the city of God. Because just like with 9-11, right, the fall of the city of Rome, what did that represent for the people? But the rug being pulled out from under them in terms of their feeling of security in their world. And so Augustine says, if you want security, if you want to live without that fear, the only way to do it is to put your faith entirely on the grace of God. Um, because if salvation is up to us, we can throw it away. And if we can, we will. And so no one can be happy, blessed, let alone saved, if salvation can be lost. Because if salvation can be lost, we would all live with the fear of losing it. Now again, I want to point out to you the shift he's making. Because before this, the, uh, the early church theologians all assumed that salvation could be lost. This was that whole thing about, you know, um, what do you do with post-baptismal sin, right? So he's making a shift here. Um, I told you when we studied the, the theologians, Irenaeus and Tertullian, that they represent a kind of departure from philosophy. Right? Irenaeus 
saying that philosophy only leads to Gnosticism. Tertullian saying, you know, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? So these guys represent a departure from philosophy and a, and a distrust of philosophy. Augustine takes that even further by making the departure from philosophy based on an anthropology, an anthropology that doesn't trust the human being. And so we are coming to a point where we have lost that classical optimism that said humans have free will and that said um, virtue is an end in itself and, and that had a, a stoic um, idea that, that virtue was progress toward perfection. With Augustine, all that is out the window. And so if, if we want to summarize Augustine at this point, we can do it in terms of faith, hope, and love. He writes in the handbook on faith, hope, and love, in terms of faith, faith leads to understanding, not the other way around. In terms of hope, total dependence on God's grace. If, if we had to depend on our, ourselves, we would have no hope. And in terms of love, happiness is love oriented toward God, not toward the things of the world. Yes. In terms of faith, faith leads to understanding, not the other way around. In terms of hope, hope is found in a total dependence on God and God's grace. Not in, not in relying on on humanity, human free will, or any of that, or human perfection. And then in terms of love, um, happiness or blessedness is love oriented toward God, because love oriented toward anything other than God doesn't give you love, it gives you fear. All right, yes, question there. Go ahead. Let's go back to uh, what we've now lost with him, optimism, free will, virtue, is progress towards perfection. There's something else just in there. Now. Yeah, what have we lost? Well, it, the, uh, the, the classical, uh, and when I say classical, I mean from the classical world, um, the ancient world, had an, a more optimistic view of human nature, that people have free will, that we can prog progress toward perfection, and that virtue is an end in itself. Um, see, for Augustine now, virtue is going to become kind of a means to an end, and the end being loving God. Um, so, I think that's... Good. Any other questions at this point? So, I'm going to switch gears. So, we yeah. don't have free will with Augustine. We just have more, like, more or less a predestination. Well, right, and I'm going to go into that in more detail in the second hour tonight. We're going to talk about free will when we deal with the Pelagian controversy. Um, Technically speaking, he is going to talk about free will, or he's going to talk about the human will, but he's going to say that the will is so fallen that we're, we're really only free to sin. We're free, we have free will in the sense we can want to do the right thing, but our will isn't free enough to actually do the right thing. We know we want to do the right thing, but we just can't pull it off. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Without later. the grace of God. Without the grace of God. Pulling us to do the right thing. Exactly, things. yes, right. The question yes. for you, does Augustine go as far as uh, Calvin does later in terms of if you are the elect, there's no way you can lose your salvation? I think he is saying that. Um, and I, I think that most of what we see in Calvin is, is in Augustine. Um, and... Uh, that's why I say that, you know, by the, by the later writings of Augustine, he's got, he's got the irresistible grace. Uh, limited atonement is implied, um, and, uh, and the perseverance is implied, I think, but, but strongly implied that, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're of the elect, you know, you, you will persevere and be saved. But again, because God is doing it. It's, it's an act of God. Um, any other questions at this point? Okay, bear with me a little longer because now I need to say a few things about donatism uh, because uh, we need to just cover this. Now, uh, 
we're getting to the point in the course where I'm going to sometimes need to backtrack a little bit to give you the backstory on things. And so that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, we need to talk about Donatism, and so I need to back up a bit. After the Great Persecution, remember, beginning of the 4th century, right? So 303, 304, uh, Great Persecution ends, um, 313, right? Okay, so after the Great Persecution, the problem of the lapse emerged again. Remember, we saw it after Decius' persecution in the middle of the 3rd century, 250s, right? And then what to do with the people who made the sacrifices. Okay, so that whole issue comes back again after the great persecution in the 4th century. And you'll remember when we talked about it with regard to the 3rd century, the sacramental implications of the problem of the lapsed had to do with baptism, right? So what do you do if you found out you were baptized by someone who had lapsed? Is the baptism still valid? We went through that whole controversy. Well, now, the question of the validity of baptism is extended to ordination uh, and the consecration of a bishop. Uh, even though it's a little bit early to talk about these as sacraments, per se, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll still put them in that category. Uh, what ends up happening is we have a new bishop elected in Carthage. In 311, uh, the new bishop is Caecilian. Sorry. Caecilian of Carthage. Elected 311. That's C A E C I L I A N. Sorry about the bad handwriting. Now, sorry. 311? Yeah, 311. Yeah. Like, uh, like the, the, uh, the bishops of Rome, like uh, Cornelius and Stephen, um, Caecilian represents kind of a middle way in dealing with the lapsed. Um, what he wants to do is allow the lapsed back into the church, uh, reconcile them with penance, but not rebaptize them. So that's why he's a middle way. Um, you know, no rebaptism on the one end, but on the other side, you know, not just simply letting them in without penance. So, uh, reconciliation with penance is, is kind of the middle way there. But there's a group of rigorists in North Africa who held a what, what I'm calling the North African view of the sacraments so that they would believe that if, if you were baptized by someone who had lapsed, that baptism is not valid. So they also believed that if a bishop is consecrated and someone who is consecrating him, another bishop, is said to have lapsed, they would question the validity of the consecration of the new bishop. Because, you know, like a confirmation, a consecration is a point at which the Holy Spirit is conferred uh, and the, the mantle of leadership is transferred, right? So, so the rigorists said that um, not only baptism but also ordination is valid only if the clergy doing it is worthy. And they called the lapsed infected and considered themselves the true church and formed a kind of a schism and started rebaptizing people. And to discredit Caecilian, they claimed that a bishop who had consecrated him, a guy named Felix, they claimed he had been a traitor. Remember what a traitor is someone who hands over scriptures to be burned, or um, in this case, um, someone who names names. Is, well, I don't have any scriptures, but I'll tell you who the lectors are. You can go to their house. They, have, they keep the scriptures at their house. You know? Now, as it turns out, the charge wasn't true. But um, at, at the beginning, the rigorists actually forged some documents to try and create evidence to prove that Felix had been a traitor. And so they rejected Caecilian as Bishop of Carthage on the basis of this accusation that the guy who had consecrated him, Felix, was a traitor. And so they uh, consecrated their own leader as bishop. And, um, and, and so this is the situation when Constantine became the emperor of the West in 312. He becomes emperor of the West. Now, he's not even emperor of the whole empire yet. He's emperor of the West. 
and he faces a, a possible schism in the Western Church. So the first thing he did was he wrote to the Bishop of Rome. Uh, the Bishop of Rome was a guy named Miltiades, if you're keeping score. And so he writes to the Bishop of Rome, and he says, will you please fix this? And ask Miltiades to summon Caecilian and his supporters, and the rigorist faction, the accusers, and their supporters, to a synod in Rome. And, um, and so there was a synod held in Rome in 313. It was held in the Lateran Palace. If you've been to Rome, um, the Lateran Palace is now uh, at the Cathedral of Rome, St. John Lateran. It's where the Holy Stairs are now. And um, so this is where the, the, this early synod was held. And the Emperor Constantine ordered um, both sides, Caecilian and his accusers, to submit to the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Now in reality, there was a kind of jury made up of a group of Italian bishops. But Miltiades presided over the council. So again, notice what Constantine has done here, is he's made the Bishop of Rome the judge in this matter between bishops, or you know, in this dispute over a bishop's see. And so um, this is, a, again, another step on the path toward the increasing authority of the Bishop of Rome. Now, about this time, the guy that the rigorists had consecrated as their bishop died. So they had to pick a new one. And he was replaced by a man named Donatus. And then you can see this is why they're called Donatists, because their leader throughout uh, this, from, from here on, was Donatus. He was, uh, he was Irish, his first name was Duncan. <laughs> That's not true. Don't write that. <laughs> but uh, they met under the authority of the Bishop of Rome, and uh, really, Caecilian is the one on trial here, but he was cleared. Donatus and his followers were condemned for rebaptizing and for creating a schism. And notice that now that Constantine is the emperor in the West, so the church has the backing of the emperor, rebaptism is now not only um, a heresy, but it's illegal. So force of law supports the uh, decisions of the church. So rebaptism is illegal, and, um, and but actually, to his credit, Notiades did not automatically say that all Donatist bishops must be deposed. He had a plan that would allow um, for, for them to remain as bishops. If there were two bishops in one city, one Catholic and one Donatist, then seniority would decide which one became the bishop of that city, and the younger one could be given a see in another town. Um, but the Donatists were not happy with this, and they now accused Miltiades of also being a traitor and of taking bribes. After this point, though, Constantine only corresponded with Caecilian as the legitimate bishop of Carthage. And so what that does is, um, and we've talked about this before in the context when we were talking about Constantine, what it does is it shows that Constantine as emperor has um, made his choice for the Catholics as the official church in North Africa over against the Donatists. And it was, uh, it was to Caecilian that Constantine gave the money to rebuild the churches that were destroyed in the persecution. Now, the Donatists complained to Constantine, but if you remember anything from the Arian controversy, you know that only makes him mad. Complaining to Constantine does not help your cause. And so Constantine just got mad at the Donatists. He believed they should simply accept the decision of the bishops of the council, but they complained because the court at the council, uh, at the synod in Rome, was made up of all Italian bishops, and they felt that they were underrepresented, and it was unfair. And so Constantine decided uh, that he would have another council, 
that would settle the issue once and for all. In the meantime, uh, they found that the evidence against Felix was forged, and so that was proven to be false. So Felix is cleared. Uh, he was not a traitor. But all of this led to the Council of Arles in 314. Um, and I've mentioned this council before uh, as the first council attended by an emperor. So Constantine himself convened the Council of Arles, uh, arguably the first council uh, convened by an emperor as well, uh, in, in 314. But remember, this is still not an ecumenical council. This is before the Council of Nicaea, because remember, I'm giving you the backstory here. Um, Constantine is only the emperor of the West. And so while this is considered a kind of general council of the West, it's only authoritative over the West. So only Western bishops attended. Uh, the Bishop of Rome was not there personally, but was represented by some priests. And it was for the Council of Arles that Constantine gave the bishops the authority to use the uh, public transportation system for free. And um, I may have mentioned this already, but the council, of course, condemned rebaptism and affirmed the Roman view of baptism that only baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit is valid, and that is what makes it valid. Um, but because the, uh, the Donatists had accused not only Felix, but Miltiades, uh, of being traitors when they were not, the Council of Arles also created some rules around what it means to be a traitor because it became a very convenient accusation if you wanted to get rid of somebody to accuse them of being a traitor. And so the Council defined what a traitor was in a, in a narrow sense, that being a traitor means surrendering the scriptures or Eucharistic vessels, but if you surrendered other things like vestments or, you know, I mean, there are stories of people surrendering shoes and other kinds of bizarre stuff, um, other utensils, things like that. That doesn't count. And all of this was a defeat for the Donatists because they wanted the broadest definition possible because they wanted to be able to accuse um, people of traitors. And in fact, the council decreed that. Um, falsely accusing someone of being a traitor would lead to excommunication for life. And so notice what the council is saying here is basically the same conclusion that we came to after the persecutions in the third century that, that the worst thing, the worst thing you, sin you can really commit is to split the church. That schism is worse than apostasy. So even if these guys were traitors, to split the church over it is even worse. And the point, and, and also that um, if you're going to accuse somebody of being a traitor, you need to produce public records that prove it, because there would be public records of someone having been interrogated. Um, but the point is that even if someone was a traitor, if they ordained someone else, that ordination is not necessarily invalid because it's God who does the sacrament, not the presider. Just as we saw with baptism, the Roman view of the sacraments is that the, the faith of the presider doesn't matter, doesn't, doesn't invalidate the sacrament. What makes the sacrament valid is that it is simply done correctly. Um, there's a Latin phrase for this. The sacrament works Let me double check my spelling. Yeah. Ex opere operatu. Ex operato. Ex opere operatu. It works because it's worked. It works because it's done. By the very fact of the action being performed, regardless of who does it, a sacrament is valid. So, um, so the sacrament is valid 
because it's done be, and, and because God is faithful, not because the presider is or is not faithful. So the, the principle that was previously applied to baptism now applies to ordination. It is God who ordains. Uh, a couple other things from the Council of Arles real quickly, just uh, because they're interesting. Um, no bishop can welcome someone excommunicated by another bishop. You know, we've seen this before. Bishops have to enforce each other's excommunications. And also, the Council of Arles mandated that Christians were not exempt from military service. Now think about this. We have Christians like Tertullian saying uh, that, that believers should not be in the military. But now the situation is different because we have a Christian emperor who will presumably make Christianity the favored religion and eventually Christianity will become the only legal religion which means everybody's expected to be a Christian if they're, if they're a citizen. Which means if you don't have Christians serving in the military, you got no more military, right? I mean, so, so Constantine can see this coming. And at this point already in 314, it becomes important to say, well, wait a minute. Let's not start thinking that just because you're a believer, you're exempt from military service. Because, again, you know, the, they, would, they would have no legions if, if it went that way. All right, so that's 314. The next year, 314, three, in 315, the Donatists rioted in North Africa. And Constantine, again, ordered both groups to appear before him, um, which really didn't accomplish anything. Uh, so in the following year, 316, Constantine ordered all Donatist churches confiscated. And Donatists could be arrested if they attempted to evangelize Catholics. There were more uprisings. A few Donatists were killed uh, by, angry, uh, by an angry mob. Um, and the persecution, and, and so what we have here is persecution at the hands of the emperor against the Donatists. But Constantine became uncomfortable with that, uh, as you can maybe imagine, uh, because it hadn't been very long since the empire was persecuting all Christians. Now here he is persecuting the Donatists in the name of the church. So by 321 or so, he backed off on the persecution. And the Donatists themselves got involved in the city politics of Carthage and were able to retain their cathedral in Carthage to the point where Constantine basically had to back off and he basically had to say, all right, you Donatists, you keep the cathedral, I'll pay for the Catholics to build another one. So that's, that's what it came down to. Um, we're almost ready to take a break here, but let me just point out some things. Uh, notice the difference between the Novationists after the persecution of the third century and the Donatists after the great persecution. The Novationists were rigorists. They were schismatics. They rebaptized. But because they were able to send a delegate to the Council of Nicaea and sign the creed, they were accepted as orthodox or as a valid expression of Christianity even though uh, not considered Catholic. Their clergy could retain their status if they came back to the church. They were allowed to keep their property until the 5th century when they will be persecuted in the West. Um, but Donatism seemed to have more of a, of a connection to a sacramental theology, and that made them heretics on top of everything else. And so they uh, were not tolerated in the way that the Novationists were. And so by the time Augustine, becomes bishop in Hippo in North Africa, the Donatists are going to be a thorn in his side uh, because now you have two separate groups of Christians in each city. And so to Augustine, the Donatists were the rigorous down the street. Um, they were Puritans. They were iconoclasts. Um, but on the other hand, they threw the best parties because they had big fiestas for the uh, feasts of the martyrs. 
And uh, we're told that the Donatists' hymn singing was so loud that Augustine's congregation could not hear him preaching. They would also become violent, starting riots in the 4th century. Augustine tried reconciliation with them, but here's the problem. The Donatists in Hippo were the majority, and the Catholics were the minority. So imagine Augustine going to the Donatists saying, you know, we'd love to just have you guys join us and you know, reconcile if you will only join us again. And they probably laughed in his face because they were the majority. In the year 412, the emperor of the West, a guy named Honorius, issued an e edict. What did I say? 412? Honorius issued an edict against Donatism, bringing back the persecution against the Donatists. Donatist clergy were to be exiled. Their property was to be confiscated. There were fines for being members of a Donatist church, uh, fines on a graded scale, depending on your standing in society. And so the persecution does come back. But the Donatists don't go away. Um, now, obviously, Augustine took the Roman view of the sacraments um, over against the North African view. So we have these two different ecclesiologies. Um, for Augustine, only the faith of the recipient matters, not the faith of the presider. And so that the, the sacrament is done as long as it's done right. But that has even bigger implications for the ecclesiology um, the, the theory of the church that each group held because the Donatists as rigorists are working with an exclusivist ecclesiology. They're working with an ecclesiology that says they are the true church, maybe even the perfected church, and anyone else is infected. And they don't want to allow those others in because they believe the impure might taint the pure. And so the Donatists have an ecclesiology that says we're going to maintain purity by keeping out all those who are impure. Augustine has a different ecclesiology, and Augustine has the ecclesiology that's represented in Rome as well. Augustine has an ecclesiology that says it's more important to maintain unity than pur purity. Or if anything, we'll say that we're, you know, that the church is pure, but then we want to include everyone in the hopes that the purity will purify the impure. See the difference? What's stronger, purity or impurity? If purity is stronger, then you hope purity will purify the impure. If impurity is stronger, then you fear that impurity will taint the pure. So Augustine has an inclusive ecclesiology based on the uh, parable of the wheat and the weeds. Remember the parable of the wheat and the weeds? Uh, Master, someone has sown weeds among your wheat. Shall we weed it? Shall we pluck them out? What does the master say? No, don't pull out the weeds yet because you might pull out some of the good wheat. You might not be able to tell the difference. This was Augustine's image for the church. You can't tell the difference. You can't look at a person and decide, are they wheat or weeds, right? Only God knows that. And not even God is doing the weeding yet, right? Um, now, Augustine knew full well that there were people in his church who were, as he called them, the fakes. So not only do you have the Donatists, but you also, you know, in the other church, you have the fakes in your own church. Because remember, once the empire goes fully Christian, then it's desirable to get baptized and be a Christian if you want to be an upwardly mobile citizen, right? So Augustine knows full well there are people in his church who are Christian only for the social perks. He calls them the fakes. But the body of, the body of Christ might, must be a mixed body, like the wheat and the weeds. And uh, if it's impossible for humans to be perfect, it's also impossible for the church to be perfect. 
And so the church is going to be like Noah's Ark. It's going to have the clean animals and the unclean animals <laughs> in it. And it's not up to us to sort them out. What will sort them out is God's election, God's predestination. And so again, everything relies on God. He pushes all the responsibility for this on God and God's grace and God's election. Well, we're going to go into this in more detail in our second hour when we talk about the Pelagian controversy, but I'll just tell you that um, in the year uh, 429, the city of Hippo was uh, besieged by Vandals, another barbarian tribe, who laid siege to the city, surrounded it, and cut off its supplies. Um, no clean water leads to malaria, and Augustine himself died of malaria in 430. But the Donatists uh, in Hippo outlived him. And in fact, the Donatists and the Catholics existed side by side in North Africa until um, the invasions of the Arabs in the seventh century when all forms of Christianity were pretty much driven out. Okay, so any questions on Augustine or the Donatists? Yes, question there. Augustine. Know, was very pessimistic about the human nature, but yet he had a high hopes that the church, you know, you know, God, you know, was pure, or purity would um, erase the impurity you know, of of those, you know, who were, you know, I guess, not of God, I guess, or yeah. Well, I don't know if I would go so far as to say that he hoped that someone who was not among the elect would become purified by being in the church. I mean, he might have held out that as a possibility, but in reality. Um, it's, it's more like you, you don't kick anybody out because you don't know who the elect are. You might be kicking out someone who's elect and you don't know it. And so really what's going to determine uh, a person's salvation is God's election or, or what we would call predestination. Um, and so, so ultimately we don't try to weed out the people who aren't the elect because we would be usurping God's prerogative if we did that. That's God's responsibility, not ours. And so that's really what he's saying, is that it's up to God to make that call. Any other questions? All right, good. Well, let's take a break.